I'm sure you can all remember that John Lennon urged us, imagine there's no heaven, it's easy if you try, no hell below us, above us only sky. But it turns out Americans aren't turning to Leninism any faster than Leninism. Today, 81% say they believe in heaven, an increase of 10% since a decade ago. Of those, 71% say it is an actual place. In fact, 43% believe they're pets, their cats, rats and snakes are headed into the hereafter with them to be stroked for eternity. America's branch of heaven is crammed full, even as the European and Asian wings are long since dissolved by the brisk winds of reason and scepticism. So why can't Americans get over the pearly gates? That's what I want to think about. In this book, Heaven, that came out last year by Newsweek's religion correspondent, Lisa Miller, she kind of, she kind of offers this fascinating millennia-long history of the idea of heaven, spliced with some kind of mediocre reporting on present-day believers. At its core, it is a very politely administered slap to the American consensus. The heaven you think you're headed to, a reunion with your lost relatives in the light, is actually a very recent invention. It's only a little bit older than Goldman Sachs. Most of the believers in heaven across most of history would have found it totally incomprehensible and unrecognisable. It turns out that heaven is a constantly shifting shape because it is a history of subconscious human longings. Show me your heaven and I'll show you what's lacking in your life. The desert dwellers who wrote the Bible and the Quran lived in thirst so their heavens were forever running with rivers and, and fountains and springs. African-American slaves believed they were headed for a heaven where the first would be last and the last would be first. So they would be the free men dominating white slaves. Today's Islamist suicide bombers live in a society starved of sex. So their heaven is a 72 virgin gangbang. Emily Dickinson, my favourite poet, wrote, Heaven is what I cannot reach. The apple on the tree, provided it do hopeless hang, that heaven is to me. We know precisely when this story of projecting our lack into the sky began, 165 BC, patented by the ancient Jews. Until then, heaven, Shamayim, was the home of God and his angels. Occasionally, God would descend from it to give orders and indulge in a little bit of light smiting, but there was a strict no dead people door policy. Humans did not get in, and they didn't expect to. The best you could hope for after death was for your bones to be buried with your people in a shared tomb and your story to go on through your descendants. It was a realistic, humanistic approach to death. You go, but your people live on. So how did the idea of heaven as a perfect place where God lives and where you end up if you live right rupture this reality? The different components of it have been floating around in the atmosphere of Jerusalem looking for a home, as Miller puts it, for a while. The Greeks had believed there was an eternal soul that ascended when you die. The Zoroastrians had believed you would be judged in the end time for your actions on earth. The Jews believed in an almighty Yahweh. But it took a big, bloody bang to fuse all these aspects together. In the run-up to heaven's invention, the Jews were engaged in a long civil war over whether to open up to the Greeks and their commerce, or to remain sealed away, insular and pure. With no winner in sight, King Antiochus got pissed off. He invaded, and he tried to wipe out the Jewish religion entirely, replacing it with worship of Zeus. The Jews saw that all that was most sacred of them was being shattered. They were ordered to sacrifice swine before a statue of Zeus that now dominated their holy temple. The Jews who refused were hacked down Rwanda-style in the streets. Many young men fled into the hills of Palestine to stage a guerrilla assault, now remembered, obviously, as the Hanukkah story. The old Jewish tale about how you continue after you die was itself dying. Your bones couldn't be gathered by your ancestors anymore, with so many Jews scattered and on the run. So suddenly, death took on a new terror. Was this it? Were all these lives ending forever for nothing? One of the young fighters, known to history only as Daniel, announced that the martyred Jews would actually receive a great reward. Many of those who sleep in the dust shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt, he wrote, and launched us on the road to the best-selling 1990s trash 90 Millets in Heaven. Daniel's idea was wildly successful. Within a century, 
most Jews believed in heaven, and the idea has never died. But while the key components of heaven were in place, it was not the Kumbaya holiday camp it's become today. It was a place where you and God and the angels sat, but Jesus warned, quote, there is no marriage in heaven, end quote. You didn't join your relatives. It was you, it was God, and it was eternal prayer. It was paradise, but not as we know it. Even some atheists regard heaven as one of the least harmful religious ideas, a soothing blanket to press onto the brow of the bereaved. But in fact, its primary function for centuries was, a tool, was as a tool of control and intimidation. The Vatican, for example, declared that it had a monopoly on St Peter's VIP list, and only those who obeyed the church authorities every command and paid the massive sums for get-out-of-hell free cards would get themselves and their children into it. The afterlife was a means of tyrannising people in this life. This use of heaven as a bludgeon long outlasted the Protestant Reformation. Miller points out that in Puritan New England, heaven wasn't primarily a comfort, but rather a way to impose discipline here on earth. It still gets used that way. For example, Mormons order women within their ranks who try to argue for full equality to recant. And if they don't, they're told they'll be sent to a separate afterlife from their families for all of eternity. There's some really heartbreaking examples in Miller's book of that. Worse still, the promise of heaven is used every day as an incentive for people who want to commit atrocities. I've seen this in practice. I've met wannabe suicide bombers from London to Gaza, and they all launched into reveries about the orgy they'll embark on in the clouds. Similarly, I was once sent, as my own personal purgatory, to go on the Christian Coalition Solidarity Tour of Israel, and as we stood at Megiddo, the site described in the Book of Revelation as the launch pad for the apocalypse, they bragged that hundreds of thousands of Arabs would soon be slaughtered there, while George Bush and his friends are raptured up to heaven as a reward for leading the Arabs to their deaths. Heaven can be an inducement to horror. When she's tracking the history of these ideas, Miller is highly competent, but she also interweaves a kind of travelogue across America during which she interviews believers in heaven, and here the book becomes just insufferable. She describes herself as a professional sceptic, but she is in fact, in this respect, professionally credulous. Instead of trying to tease out what these fantasies of an afterlife reveal about her, her interviewees, she, quiz, she just quizzes everyone about heaven, as if she's planning to write a Lonely Planet guide to the area, demanding more and more intricate details. She only just stops at demanding to know what the carpeting will be like. But she never asks the obvious question, which is, where's your evidence? Where are you getting these ideas from? She gives loads of proof that the idea of heaven can be comforting or beautiful, but obviously that doesn't make it right. The difference between wishful thinking and fact-seeking is something most six-year-olds can grasp. But Miller, it seems, and a lot of the time the heaven-seeking majority, refuse it. Obviously, I would like to see my friends and relatives who died again. I would also like there to be world peace and million dollars in my checking account and for Matt Damon to ask me to marry him. If I took my longing as proof that they were going to happen, you'd think I was deranged. One of Miller's interviewees says rationalist questions are not helpful. And that, that interviewee is a professor at Harvard. This seems to be Miller's view too. She stresses that to believe in heaven, you have to make a leap of faith. But in what other field in life do we abandon all need for evidence? Why do it in one so crucial to your whole sense of existence? And if you're going to leap beyond proof, why leap to the Christian heaven? Why not convince yourself you're going to live after death in Narnia or Middle Earth, for which there's just as much evidence? She doesn't explain how arguments dissolve into this kind of feel-good New Age drizzle. Now, Miller does cast a quick eye over the only evidence that believers in heaven do offer. Obviously, I say evidence in inverted commas. The testimonies of people who've had near-death experiences. According to the med medical journal The Lancet, between 9% and 18% of people who've had near-death experiences report entering a tunnel, seeing a bright light, and so on. It reminds me of the one of my favourite films when I was a teenager, Flatliners, uh, which is a great film, I must rewatch it. Dinesh D'Souza, in his ludicrous book Life After Death, presents all this as proof for heaven. But in fact, there are clear scientific explanations. It turns out that as the brain shuts down, it's the peripheral vision that goes first, giving the impression of a tunnel. The centre of your vision is what remains, giving the impression of a bright light. Indeed, as Miller concedes, virtually all the features of a near-death experience, the sense of moving through a tunnel, an out-of-body feeling, spiritual or visual hallucinations, intense memories, can be reproduced with a stiff dose of ketamine, the horse tranquilizer that's a popular party drug. Now, 
is a stoned teenager in a K-hole in contact with God and on a day trip to heaven? Obviously not. Should the religious be dropping horse dope on Sundays to get there? But Miller soon runs scared from the sceptical implications of this, offering the strange balance of finding one very odd scientist who says that these experiences could point beyond life. Miller also only scratches the great conceptual hole at the heart of heaven. After a while, wouldn't it be unbelievably fucking boring? When you live in the desert, a spring seems like paradise, but when you've had this spring for a thousand years, won't you be sick of it? Heaven is, in George Orwell's words, an attempt to produce a perfect society by an endless continuation of something that had only been valuable because it was temporary. Take away that contrast and heaven becomes hell. And yet, of course I understand why so many people want to believe in heaven even now. It's a way, however futilely, of trying to escape the awful emptiness of death. As Philip Larkin put it, not to be here, not to be anywhere, and soon, nothing more terrible, nothing more true. Yes, there is a pain in seeing this, but there's also, I think, a liberation in seeing beyond the childhood myths of our species. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, written in Babylon 4,000 years ago, the eponymous hero travels into the gardens of the gods in an attempt to discover the secret of eternal life. His guide tells him the secret. There is no secret. This is it. This is all you're going to get. This life. This time. Once. Enjoy your life, the goddess Siduri tells him. Love the child who holds you by your hand and give your wife pleasure in your embrace. It's John Lennon's dream, four millennia ahead of schedule, above his only sky. Gilgamesh returns to the world and lives more intensely and deeply than before, knowing there's no celestial after party and no forever. After all this time, wouldn't it be better to finally follow Gilgamesh? Gilgamesh.